Hello, Dr. Matsuda. Hi, how are you, Carmen? I'm good. How are you? Good. I am I am the one who's gonna be with you, helping you with anything you need. Um, I'm going to start with a introduction and then uh the screen will be yours. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Screen looks dark. Um, I'm going to start right now. It's eight o'clock, so just so you know. Okay. All right. Um, distinguished participants, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And a warm welcome to the 13th International Conference for Teachers of English, New Perspectives in TAFL in the post-pandemic era. It is an immense privilege to have you here today joining us as we come together to explore and discuss important topics in teaching English as a foreign language in these transformative times. <clears throat> Our first session today presents a remarkable opportunity to extend a heartfelt welcome to a distinguished educator and scholar whose contributions to the field of English language education has been truly invaluable. With great pleasure, I introduce to you Dr. Paul K. Masuda. Dr. Matsuda is a professor of English and director of second language writing at Arist Arizona State University. There, he works closely with doctoral students specializing in second language writing from various disciplinary perspectives. Dr. Matsuda is founding chair of the Symposium of Second Language Writing and series editor of the Parlor Press series on second language writing. Former president of the American Association for Applied Linguistics, he has also served as the founding chair of the CCC Committee on Second Language Writing and the chair of the non-native uh, non -native English speakers in TESOL at TESOL International Association. Dr. Matsuda has published widely in Applied Linguistics, Writing, Studying, and TESOL. And has served and, and has received a number of prestigious awards for his publications. He uses a diverse array of theoretical and methodological tools to investigate topics such as disciplinary history, identity in written discourse, professional development, writing for publication, writing and language assessment, teaching and learning, and writing program administration. Once more, I extend a sincere warm welcome to each of you. Let us approach this conference with minds receptive to new ideas and hearts open to collaboration as we collectively navigate the ever-evolving landscape of English language education. And now, with any further ado, I hand over the stage to you, Dr. Matsuda. The screen is yours. Great. Thank you, Carmen. I really liked your present uh, the introduction and how you talked about the importance of having an open mind in order to address the issues that we all face. Okay, so hi everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, the topic today is teaching writing at the university level. Now, I didn't choose this particular topic. I was asked to talk about the university level. Uh, so I have to start with a little bit of a disclaimer that teaching writing at the university level is not essentially different from teaching writing in other contexts especially when you think about the broader philosophical uh, ideas about what we teach and how we teach it. And this workshop is not going to focus so much on what to do in your classroom because every situation is different. Instead, I want to take a step back and think broadly with you about the philosophy behind teaching what or teaching writing, what writing is, and how we can conceptualize writing and the teaching of writing. So first, <clears throat> in order to teach anything, we need to know what it is that we are teaching. And the answer to this question may seem obvious at the beginning, 
But when you really think about it, there are many different ways in which writing can be conceptualized. Some people think of writing as a thing that we produce, the written discourse, and other people might see it as a verb, right? Uh, that is the act of writing. And historically, writing in the late 19th century and early 20th century by structural linguists uh, was conceptualized as the transcription of speech and an ac inaccurate one at that because written language, once it evolves uh, in uh, Indo-European language, especially, um, they transcribe, they, they represent the sound to some extent, but they don't accurately represent the sound because the spoken language continues to evolve and the gap between the spoken, the pronunciation of spoken language and the spelling of written language tend to widen. And stru uh, structural linguists considered speech to be primary. So they thought writing was inaccurate. And that's why they invented IPA, uh, International Phonetic Alphabet um, to begin with. <clears throat> and in this, conception of writing, what we teach is basically we teach speech and then teach students how to spell things and then students should be able to write. But in the 1960s, when writing classes began to appear uh, rapidly in the US, uh, US higher education, because of the large number of international students coming to the US, teachers quickly realized that being able to speak didn't translate into the ability to write. So in order to write, students actually needed to practice writing, um, surprise, surprise. Um, and there were many different uh, considerations that went into writing. And another conception uh, around the 1960s, uh, and this was a shift from the earlier conception of writing as a transcription of speech, was that both speech and writing and sign languages were manifestations of our grammatical competence that's in our head. And grammar, as you know, deals with issues below the sentence level. And so in terms of transcribing sentences, this conception may have worked, but as many of you realize, writing is more than just an accumulate, simple accumulation of sentences. There are different organizations uh, for discourse, and this organization is not governed by grammatical rules, but it's governed by the social context and the interactional context and the meaning and the people. Uh, so this conception was also limited. And in the 1960s, uh, in writing studies, many people started arguing the importance of personal exploration, expression, and growth. And <clears throat> so the focus was not so much on well-formed text, but the ability to write freely and use creative expressions um, in order to explore their own ideas, identity, and so forth. Now, this is one important function of writing. Uh, and we perhaps we can continue to teach some of that in order to help students become comfortable uh, with writing. But we don't always write for personal purposes. Sometimes we have to write for academic purposes, business purposes, and so on. And so in the 1980s, the emphasis shifted to writing as a tool for communication. And in the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, the genre approach to teaching uh, began to emerge, which provided an understanding of how written discourse is used and what different features are involved in different contexts and different genres. And that allowed us to come up with a better understanding of how writing can be conceptualized, exemplified, and taught in the classroom. And that along with writing as a process, which is um, always accompanies any act of writing, um, became two major approaches to the teaching of writing. But more broadly, 
I like to think of writing as one of the meaning making resources. As human beings, when we communicate, we are using different modes of communication. Right now, I'm using the video as a medium and I am speaking using my um, sound, sound communication, right? Lingu sound, uh, speech communication. But I'm also using my facial expressions, smiling, gestures sometimes, and PowerPoint, uh, including written language and visuals in order to complement my message. So we are constantly, uh, in fact, using multimodal resources in our communication. And writing is one of those resources that we have at hand. And the next question is, why is it necessary to teach writing? And some people say, well, we have to teach students to pass the test. Now, it is one important uh, aspect of writing. Writing is often used for exams. Uh, written tests, or there are writing tests, the test of writing abilities as well. Although they are sometimes high stakes and important to students' lives, they are not the only reason that we teach writing. In fact, if we only taught writing to pass for students to pass the test, students may be able to pass the test, but they won't be able to do anything with the skills that they learn. And learning to write is not easy. And just passing the test is not worth the investment. And another purpose that many people see is to prepare students for courses across the disciplines. To prepare students with general knowledge, knowledge of various tasks, various situations, uh, faculty expectations, so that students can function appropriately in various university classrooms. And, but students are not going to be students forever, and they will be moving on, becoming professionals, and they will be using writing uh, in, in order to communicate internally, externally, and so, in some cases, they may have to produce promotional materials, online materials, uh, in order to function, and contracts, legal documents, and so forth. So workplace writing um, may also be uh, one of the contexts for which we are preparing our students. And not everybody will go to graduate school, but for those who do, having an understanding of academic writing and preparation for academic writing can be important. And beyond graduate school, uh, and while students are in the graduate school, sometimes they are asked to write for publication. In some, in some countries, this is a requirement for graduation which I don't think is reasonable, but this is an, an ongoing uh, trend. And the dilemma for many people is that writing is not taught to them systematically or consistently. So students have had very little practice in writing and all of a sudden they are expected to pu produce publishable manuscripts. Now that's a daunting task for anyone, even for experienced academics. Um, so in order to help students for these longer term goals, it is important to start early and teach students to write or at least help students practice writing often. And beyond academic and professional context, we also have life outside of uh, our professional self. And for some students, being able to communicate with their friends through social media or participate in political activities using written media uh, might be an important goal for learning. <clears throat> so those are some possible reasons that students might want to learn uh, writing. And the thing is, at the university context, we can't always anticipate what students are going to be doing. So we need to have a broader mindset about what students' needs are and then adjust accordingly. Now, as I said before, writing can be challenging. And you see the picture of the motorcycle. I'm also a motorcycle instructor. And this is, um, I was practicing a certain maneuver. 
but I wouldn't ask beginning writers to do the same thing because it's scary for them at the beginning, right? Um, but when it comes to writing, we ask students to do scary things from the beginning. And writing is difficult for students and scary for students and for some teachers because we tend to make it so by expecting too much too soon. When in the classroom, we may focus on formal academic genres, which is foreign to students. And they are not, this is not a familiar genre and it's com complex. It's more complex than some of the spoken language that they're learning, but we tend to expect students to be able to do it. And then we provide corrective feedback and some teachers uh, continue the 1940s practice of correcting every error, which the research suggests is not productive. Um, and <clears throat> the assessment tends to be summative. That is, we look at student writing and tell them what they did well, if they did something well, but the focus is mostly on what they didn't do well. And students are evaluated, receive grades, um, but those grades only means whether they are good writers or poor writers. And those feedback or assessment may not really help students become better writers in the end. And in some classrooms, feedback at the end of the grade, uh, grading process is given only to defend the grade that is assigned. That is a tendency uh, that has been uh, identified in the research on the end comment. So how can we make writing easy and fun? Now, some teachers, and traditionally, the way to simplify writing has been to break it down into its constituent components and to teach it in the building block way starting with the sentence level exercises, helping students build their sentences. And once they can write sentences grammatically, they move on to paragraph writing. And the paragraph writing is taught in a highly structural way. And that is, uh, and this is a 1970s and 1980s idea. Um, students are taught that the paragraph should have a topic sentence and three supporting sentences and a concluding sentence. Well, um, if you really look at how paragraphs are being used, they don't necessarily follow this formula. Sometimes the topic sentence is found at the end of the paragraph, sometimes in the middle, sometimes it's non-existent at all because they may be buried in other paragraphs. So teaching paragraphs structurally has very limited use in the long run. And it allows students to produce something that looks organized, but they are not organizing their ideas according to the communicative needs or audience needs. They are just following the formula. That is not preparing students to write. That is just preparing students to produce something that satisfies us, instant gratification. And on a larger scale, the five paragraph essay, introductory paragraphs, uh, followed by three supporting uh, paragraphs and a concluding paragraph, functions in a similar way. It's easy to teach and relatively easy to learn, and students can produce something that looks like a well-organized essay once they master it. But one of the problems that we have seen is that when we try students to write something more realistic in the real world, they tend to default to the five paragraph essay format because that's the only thing that they know how to do. And that's a huge, that's been a huge problem. And the teaching of writing in this traditional way tends to be much more repetitive. That is, um, students learn the template and then they produce it. They get some feedback, corrective feedback, and then they get grades. And then they try again do the same thing over and over. I was just watching a YouTube video uh, or I think it maybe what um, Instagram video, I guess, uh, of someone explaining um, 
one of the learning principles. And he said, if you are just doing the same thing over and over that you already know how to do, you are not learning anything. You are just demonstrating and refining what you already know. In order to learn and get better, we need to challenge ourselves. We need to write in or do something different, something that's challenging and something that's different. So when it comes to writing, keep practicing five paragraph essay is not the best way to expand our repertoire, but challenging students to write in different contexts and building on the skills that students have previously learned is a better way to teach. And the traditional way of teaching also relies on memorization and performance. Memorize the patterns and perform, spit it out, right? Again, this is not going to be generative. It's only preparing students to take tests, but nothing else. And the assessment, again, is summative assessment. That is, we just tell students that they are great or they are not. And then students feel good about themselves and not continue to practice, or students feel bad about themselves and hate writing. To me, a better way to teach writing is more like learning how to uh, create something artistically. And I'm not talking about creative writing. I'm also talking about academic writing and professional writing. When we are beginning to learn, we are not going to produce a masterpiece, no matter how hard we try. But instead, we start by playing with the materials and the tools and then create something small, something easy. And then we try creating something more challenging or make it better using additional tools or techniques and so forth, right? And for that kind of learning to happen, we need to have a meaningful context for communication because writing is a, crea uh, uh, is a meaning creation process, both for ourselves and for our readers. And when students are asked to write a five paragraph essay for the teacher, is that a meaningful context? Not really, because teachers are not interested in reading student writing, except to provide feedback and grade. You know, and students know that, so they don't take it seriously. It's not important. They just focus on doing it as quickly as possible and passing the course so that they can move on and, and do other meaningful things. So make writing meaningful. Uh, and the genres have to be realistic. That is, five paragraph essays are superficial genres that we created so that we can assess consistently in standardized setting. But that's not what we do in real life. So we need to find other kinds of writing that resonates with students' experience and future purposes. And in order for students to develop their genre awareness, as well as language awareness and skills and knowledge, students need to play with language. Now, this is something that we have known since the 1970s and 1980s through second language acquisition research. We don't learn language by memorizing and practicing. That's the 1950s and 60s theory of learning. But instead, students experiment with what they think is an appropriate expression. And then when it doesn't work, they try to make it better. That trial and error process is crucially important for the development of language and writing. But when we focus on providing rules and having students implement the rules and then correcting them on those rules, we are actually limiting students' ability and courage to play with language. And in fact, if we take off points for grades, uh, uh, for grammar, uh, take, take off points for grammar errors, what students start to do is to stop trying and start using sentences and words that they already know how to use very well because it's safer, right? And playing it safe is not how we develop. We need to challenge ourselves. And that means we need to give students some space 
to experiment with different expressions, different ways of communicating and so forth. And instead of giving them something simple and meaningless, we can sequence assignments by uh, in, in the order of increasing complexity, starting with something simple and then make it a little more complicated, uh, still using the same simple things that they learned in the previous activities. And I'll show you an example of that later. And for learning to do anything, engagement and reflections are crucial. And this goes for teachers as well. In order to become better teachers, we need to engage with our teaching. We need to care and we need to try to make things better. And we need to reflect on what we are doing. Research in cognitive science have shown us that athletes who practice for a certain amount of time, they do get better. But if you take another group of athletes who practice some of you, who use some of that time for practicing, but spend some of that time also for reflecting about what they do, how things went, how they could do things differently, or what other people do and why they do it different. Spending time reflecting actually makes them develop quicker and much better in the end. So reflection is important for teaching and it's also important for students who are learning to write or use language in general. And the assessment in the classroom can't be modeled after standardized assessment, but instead we need to focus on formative assessment, the kind of feedback that is informative and, and that helps students understand where their strengths are, where their challenges are, and continue to develop through additional practice or revisions. So just to summarize, the traditional way of teaching tends to emphasize students' performance, which can be evaluated so that we can turn in the grades at the end of the course. But a better way to teach emphasizes competence building by having students experiment with different activities in meaningful context of communication using realistic tools that they will be using in the near future. And to make mean, our context meaningful, one, thing, one place where we can look is personal relevance. Choosing familiar activities or a variation of it. We can, students are not blank slates. They come with some experience. So we can build on what they already know and what they already have. And tapping into students' personal interest or areas of expertise might also be a good idea. In the classroom, we often tell students to re do research on things that they are not interested in and then write about it as if they are experts and they are not. And sometimes students are put in an awkward position of having to write like an expert when the audience, the teacher, is the real expert. That doesn't make any sense, right? So there are ways in which novice can write, uh, but that's not going to sound like confident, uh, authoritative academic writing. Um, but if we let students write about something that they know and care about, then they can speak with authority. T technology, pop culture, uh, and other topics. They can teach us something, and we might actually enjoy reading what they have to say. And their future aspirations are also important. If they want to become doctors, lawyers, business people, having them think about how doctors, lawyers, and business people spend their time writing or what kind of writing they do can be inspirational. And it provides them with real motivation for learning to write. And the situation for writing has to be realistic. Um, that is, there has to be a real reason for writing purpose for writing, and there has to be readers who care about what they have to say, and they have to be able to play a role in the community of knowledge. And reminding students of the usefulness of every activity, every lesson is important. 
in the classroom, we have become complacent sometimes, and we don't explain the, the objectives for each assignment, or we, we don't even think about it sometimes. We just take a, an activity, bring it to the classroom, and say, do it. But students don't know why they are doing it, so they often miss the point, or they cheat, because they don't, they don't know that they're supposed to learn something. Right. So reminding them that the purpose of this activity is to help you develop the ability to do this. And if they are demonstrating the ability to do that, exactly what we ask them to develop, then other things doesn't have to be assessed or commented on all the time. Right. We can do that later when those other things are important as a learning objectives. Now, I got this idea, not from the English language teaching context, but from motorcycle instruction and scuba diving instruction. I'm also a scuba diving instructor. And in both contexts, before each activity or each exercise, the instructor will tell students that next to activity is this, and the objective is, and we tell them the objective verbatim from the manual. And that action at the beginning helps students focus their learning, right? And that's actually a really useful reminder for us teachers in the classroom as well. And realistic genres, as I started talking about this, um, include the situation, who asks you to write, why is it necessary to write? What's the purpose of writing? What are you trying to accomplish? What is the subject? And what expertise do you have? Or do you need to do research so you can understand the topic? How much do, does, does the audience understand it? And what kind of information is most useful for them? Right? That's an important consideration, subject and audience. And the writers have to have a place to speak from, a role in the communicative situation. And students need to consider the medium for communication including the genres that they're going to be using. And as I said, for development, playing with language, sometimes making errors and trying to make it better for a purpose is important. So when we are playing with language, we are not just playing for the sake of playing, but it has to be purpose-driven trying to do different things or trying to do things better or finding another way of accomplishing the same goal. Those are the kinds of activities that lead to learning. And of course, students need to read in order to write. All the great writers that I know are great readers. So reading is essential, but not all the great readers are great writers. So writing practice is also important input and output, input and output, right? And just by doing it, students will learn something. They will get more fluent, become more fluent, but they may not know exactly what's going on. And if they, they encounter a problem, if something is not working, they may not be able to fix it. So getting students into the habit of reflecting on what they are doing is also important so that they can notice what's working, what's not working, how it could be better, and what other people are doing. And those reflections will also make them more discerning readers as well, because they can use the same mindset as they read other pe uh, people's writing. And that speeds up their acquisition of discursal, uh, discursive resources. And our feedback, instead of just correcting errors, can focus more on affirming what students are doing well and to raise awareness of what's not working and strategies or alternative ways of doing things so that they can accomplish their goals better. So in a sense, um, writing teachers need to shift our position from that of a teacher or from a to that of a coach who is standing on, on the sideline and then watching what students do and then give them timely feedback 
in order to help them do better. And for tasks, uh, in order to build competencies, we need to organize tasks in increasing uh, in the order of increasing complexity. So start with small and familiar genres. And when you teach, talk about how it's related to what they have done previously, but also how the current activity will build on uh, will be built into future larger activities. And it could be the next activity that you're going to assign and or it could be future writing that they will be doing in their other courses and in their professions. That reminder of the connection between the current learning and future doing is essential for the transfer of learning. And an example of the sequencing is uh, at, the, at the bottom of the screen. We might start small with a descriptive task of bio statement and students can write their own bio statement and we can use examples from journal articles or book covers uh, of how authors represent themselves, right? And then once they are used to writing something, they, they are building their vocabulary, they are building uh, their sentence structures for bio statement and then they can tr tackle a bigger task of writing a profile of someone else or themselves, right? That's a bigger document with more complex complexity built into it. And we can teach evaluation by having students write something short, like online reviews, online product reviews or restaurant reviews. Those are genres that are familiar to students already, and they can play with those genres in order to learn. And once they are comfortable, they can write some, we can add something more complicated in the form of summary and evaluation, which uh, according to one research in the 1980s, this is one of the most common assignments in many academic uh, courses outside of the language courses. So here they are building on the ability to dis describe, which they learned through bio statement and profile, and also adding evaluation of what they have described. And once they have done a simple summary and evaluation, they are ready to move on to the next step, which is a comparative review of something. They can take two products that they know from, they are familiar with and describe them in order uh, in terms of the comparative features, and then write evaluation of both products. So you can see how the descriptive component and the evaluative component can be taught in a sm on a smaller scale at the beginning, but still using realistic genres that students can imagine. And in order to encourage engagement and reflections, we can ask students to self-assess at the end of their writing assignments. You know, as a writing teacher, I hate it when students just give me their paper and say, please provide feedback. But I love it when students say, I'm really proud of this piece of writing because of this. I did this really well, but I don't know how to do this or this part didn't work out pretty so well. Can you help me? With that kind of comments, additional comments, I can provide more pointed and useful feedback. And I can also more easily affirm students' success. All I have to say is, I agree. Or I agree to some extent in this way, right? And that encourages students' ability to develop their internal criteria for assessing their own writing as well as other people's writing. That makes them better writers, better readers, and better evaluators. And peer feedback and collaborative writing have built-in mechanism for self-assessment and the practicing what they have developed in self-assessment, right? So by doing self-assessment, they are trying to think of how to identify issues and how to uh, change them. Right, And with peer feedback and collaborative writing, they can further practice that 
in a more challenging environment. Because when they are looking at other people's writing, they may be using words and sentence structures that they are not familiar with. So when they are providing feedback, they have to learn. They have to challenge themselves to think beyond what they are currently capable of. That's actually the real value of peer feedback. Many people think that peer feedback is valuable so that students can get feedback and then correct their essays. But the, feed, uh, the impact of that kind of learning is actually not that great. Students do learn something, but it's not the most important lesson. The, uh, there is one study showing that when you compare students who only give feedback and students who only receive feedback, the ones who gave feedback tended to improve more in terms of their own writing development. And that's because when you're receiving feedback, you are getting the answers. You don't have to think. So you're just taking other people's answers and then putting them back into your writing. But when you are giving feedback, you have to read, identify what's working and what's not working. Think about how to provide feedback, how to make changes. And sometimes they have to justify their feedback, right? Students get frustrated sometimes, but I tell them, well, that frustration is the sign that you are learning something. You are challenging yourself to think beyond what you are capable of. So keep pushing, keep pressing on, right? And collaborative writing, if guided successfully, can also have the same effect. Because when somebody says, let's write it this way, you may not understand that sentence, or you may disagree, and you have to discuss and negotiate what kind of sentence structure or what vocabulary is the best for, for the task at hand. Now, that pushes students, challenges students beyond, beyond their own capability. That's a, a super good context, effective context for facilitating learning. And... Of course, providing feedback and not just providing feedback as an, a form of answers, but helping students notice something and then engaging students in thinking about what they can do to make things better. That kind of thinking and discussion, feedback and discussion can also facilitate students' development. And once you provide feedback, it's important to have students reflect because if they are just copying your answers, then students are not going to be learning anything from you. The real learning happens when they reflect on why you gave certain feedback. Or sometimes students disagree with you, right? That's not what I was trying to say, some students say. And that's a really good learning opportunity, right? So I would say, well, if you disagree, let me know. But explain why. You don't have to change it, but tell me why, right? That way they will be learning even when they are not making revisions. So it's not all in the product, but it's in the reflections and the efforts that they put into it. And that's languaging, playing with language. And also it's important to reflect on improvements over time because when we are teaching learn, uh, and learning language, Sometimes we don't see our progress and it's discouraging. An easy way to do this is to have students write something at the beginning of the class. And then at one point, mid semester or towards the end of the semester, have students do the same writing task and then compare the two texts. When they do that, they will see what difference they have made or what the, your course has made on them, right? And that's encouraging. And they can also reflect on what they learned. And that makes it more transferable down the road. Because they are aware that they have these new strategies and skills that can be used in the future. And an added benefit of this reflection is that students will never ever complain again on your teaching evaluation that they didn't learn anything in your class. And formative assessment um, requires us to recognize strength so that students are encouraged. And the recognition of strength has to be concrete and specific. If we just say, 
oh, good job with your organization. That's not a good compliment. But I like how you put this information at the beginning of this paragraph so that the readers can easily understand the explanation that you're providing, or it creates a reason for reading uh, the specific details, right? That's a specific uh, positive feedback. And that kind of feedback, positive feedback should be given at the beginning when students are still not, uh, still feeling reasonably good. Because if we give them lots of critical feedback, and then say, oh, by the way, your organization was good. They are not going to hear it because they are already discouraged and concerned about all the problems that they have. Right? So start with the positive. Okay? And when we prioritize suggestions, start with something that's relevant, re relevant to the purpose. That is, focus on the overall effectiveness. And also uh, provide feedback on structures or issues that affect meaning because both language learning, uh, second language acquisition and writing acquisition research suggest that students tend to learn better when the structural suggestions are tied to meaning. If it's not tied to meaning, if it's just struct uh, structures, then students tend to forget that because it's not important. And also prioritize learnable items. Don't comment on everything just because you happen to know. If students are not ready to learn a certain structure, then skip them. Save them for later. Or if, you, if they have too many errors, don't try to comment on everything because they can't learn everything all at once. Focus on ones that are more easily learned, which is usually something that's meaningful. And after feedback, give them a chance to practice. Revising is a good practice. And writing something similar using the same strategies, same structures is another way of reinforcing their learning. If they, even if they learn something, if they don't use it immediately, they are not likely to remember. And finally, reward behaviors that lead to learning. A good example of this is collaborative writing. Sometimes I tell students that I give the same grade for everyone when you are writing collaborative writing, doing collaborative writing. And some students say, oh, I worked harder or I could have done better if I was writing by myself, right? That happens. And if they say that, my answer is prove it. I will give you until the end of this week and you can revise it as much as you want. And if you make it better, I'll give you a higher grade. And sometimes students succeed. Sometimes it's a draw. But sometimes the revision is worse than the original. If that happens, would you give them a lower grade? I wouldn't. Because at least they've tried. And they learned something in that process even though that learning may not be tangible to us, right? So, and I don't want to discourage students from trying again, because if I gave them negative points for uh, making it worse, then they are not going to revise again next time, because that's going to be too much of a risk. So I would give them the same grade, if not higher. All right, I'm going to stop here and we have about 12 minutes um, and I'd like to hear your questions and, um, and if, if you'd like to share some of the things that you are doing that resonates um, with this, uh, these ideas about teaching writing, uh, I'd like to hear those as well. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matsuda, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, as you mentioned, you can share uh, the questions here in the chat, or you can just jump in and ask. Right, I think I can go first. I okay. 
do have a question and I was really interested in uh, the part of the presentation where you talked about um, increasing the writing tasks. So I wonder how to determine the complexity of uh, writing tasks and then how to create a sequence of tasks that are appropriate. Um, any comments or recommendations on that? Right. So if you compare a journal article and a book review, which one is more challenging? Can you repeat that? If you compare a journal article, a research article, and a book review. Oh, the book review. <laughs> right? Because yeah. it's shorter. For yeah. One thing. Mm -hmm. And also it has fewer components. Mm -hmm. The book review is basically describe and evaluate, mm -hmm. which is one of the examples that I gave, right? Yeah. And, um, but the, the journal article in the introduction, you have to describe um, the context of research, which is challenging for novice writers. And you need to describe the method and sometimes evaluate different approaches to data collection and so on, right? And the literature review is also a descriptive task. Uh, and the analysis and discussion, uh, you have to evaluate and also you have to make arguments, right? Uh, and that's a lot, lot more complex task than uh, book reviews. So before having students write a journal article, I would start with a book review. Uh, which is shorter, but we can also focus on citation practices or accuracy of summary or sentence structures and vocabulary that's appropriate for academic context. Right, thank you. Sure. Um, so we have one question in the chat that says, um, how can we balance summative and formative assessment in writing in a context where summative assessment is still predominant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we don't have to do either or. And summative assessment grading at the end is necessary, right, for most, most of us. So uh, at, in the end, we will be doing a summative assessment. But while we are helping students develop, we can begin the, the formative assessment process when we discuss their ideas preliminary ideas. So what are what topics are you thinking about? Oh, that's a good topic. Or why did you why are you interested in that? Or do you think that topic is appropriate for this project, this kind of writing, right? Now, when you have this kind of discussion, you are already providing formative assessment. Your description or your assessment of their current ideas and evaluation or questioning whether it's appropriate or not, right? So that's a form, and based on that discussion, students can change their ideas or develop their ideas. And when we see drafts, we can provide feedback, and that is formative assessment. And if we provide preliminary grade, so your preliminary grade for your collaborative writing is a B for everyone in your group, but when I give them a chance to revise on their own, I'm giving them, um, they're going to be able to use my feedback to make it better, right? So that makes it a formative evaluation or assessment. And when we give uh, assessment at, uh, at the end of the project, uh, of course, it's gonna be a summative assessment for that project. But if you say, well, you really did real, uh, well in this area, but in this area, you still seem to be struggling. So in the next assignment, let's try to focus on that aspect of writing. And when you say that, in that moment, your feedback becomes more formative in nature. Thank you for that wonderful question, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie says thank you. Um, I have another question if there is no, <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm taking this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was thinking about reflection and any recommendations on how to promote students' reflections 
in the class like given that in some cultures that's not part really part of like what a person mm-hmm. does yeah you know when we tell students to reflect they don't know what to do yeah <laughs> especially if they haven't done it before so giving them some questions to think about would be useful right and this is another thing um, that I learned as a motorcycle instructor. At the end of an activity, we ask questions relevant to the learning objectives. So after having them write a profile, you know, I might ask, so where would you put your name in a profile? And why do you think many people do that? It's at the beginning of the paragraph, right? And that's because it makes it easy to identify whose profile it is. Uh, bio statement it is, right? And just mentioning that will help students notice a particular genre feature. Thank you. Um, then would you recommend to model a reflection, like kind of saying what you're thinking while you're reflecting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we can model reflections as well. You know, sometimes I share my own writing and I say, you know, while I was writing this, I noticed that uh, this sentence um, didn't seem to connect to the previous sentence or the one after. Uh, so I took it out and tried to find other places where I'm discussing something similar. Right. Yeah. Sounds like a great idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Sure. Well, I don't see any more questions. So I think we can uh, go ahead and close this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Matsuda. It was really enlightening to listen to your presentation. And uh, I'm looking forward to your visit here in Honduras. I hope that I will be here too. So thank you very much. Me too. I hope to see you. Thank you for joining us.